Uh, thank you, Theresa, and, um, and welcome everybody to Cairns. And it's a bit disappointing that Brisbane has bowed out on us again, but um, that seems to be how it is. Uh, before I kick off today, I'd like to thank Gudjul Gudjul and uh, Gav for the welcome and uh, pay my respects, obviously, to Elders past, present and emerging, recognising that we stand now in a, in a, in a zone between or with Irukandji and, um, and Yindinji. This is an interesting time for um, traditional owner management emerging for the reef processes and I'm going to speak a little bit about that towards the end because it's very, very important to my heart and very, very important, I think, up and down the whole of the GBR when we actually introduce and welcome traditional owners properly into the management of the reef and managing their own sea country. So that's going to be a big step and I'll allude to that a little bit during this. My role today is just to give a quick background of how we ended up to be here today and um, so I'll go and do that. Now I'm pressing that big green thing and nothing's happening, mate. I'll try again. Yep, movement at the station. Okay. So a little bit of background. It, everyone says, oh, integrated pest management, and they just jump to that really quickly. Um, so I'm going to bore you to death and tell you what it actually is. Integrated pest management actually came out of agriculture way back in the 80s. Well, it was actually before then. And in truth, it's an economic model. Most people think it's about controlling pests, but it actually came out of um, economics, which no one can believe they deliver anything of relative value to, to the world, but apparently this was a good model. In the 80s, it was operationalised by the cotton industry to control basically Heliothus, Lepidoptera species. And big money, sprays were big dollars, so looking at a much more efficient way of managing pests was, was the focus of, of IPM. And it doesn't aim to eradicate, it aims to suppress pest populations below economic injury level. And that's what's really important to understand, because people think in terms of um, COTS that we're out on the Great Barrier Reef trying to eradicate them, that is not the case. So I was just putting this into perspective as we go through. Okay, then, uh, did that move? Yep. So that was in agriculture, and then some clever folks around ecology started to figure out they could use some of the similar approaches to control weed pests, primarily things like Myconia, and I ha we have in the room Dave Westcott, who I'll mention a bit later, and some of his team, like Cameron and that, that you, you guys know from COTS. But this was their stomping ground initially around, um, see that plant you see there that was introduced from Hawaii that's called Myconia and it's invading our, um, our tropical rainforest area. Now you think, how do you find plants like that in the middle of a million, I don't know, what is it, square kilometres or of, um, of rainforest? And to find those, you have to know a lot about the plant, you have to know a lot about how it's distributed, you have to develop detection techniques, and then you have to develop monitoring and man management techniques in regard to that. So that takes a fair bit of skill. So we start to move it, and we're talking about pest suppression, not eradication, and we realise that resources are not infinite. Usually in these programs, you get two bucks fifty to go out and do something marvellous with. And so you have to be a hell of a lot more smarter than just running around stabbing and killing things. So the, the concept of integrated pest management, you know, evolved to practical manipulation of pest populations using sound ecological principles to keep pest populations below level causing economic harm. This is when you take it into the environment. The emphasis here, as I said, is on practical and on ecological. And uh, not a lot of things are practical and a whole lot are not ecologically sound. So it really cuts down what you can actually do. And when we're talking about innovation, you can cut loose with a whole lot of possibilities, but the reality is you can't do it. We could say, yep, we can get rid of crown of thorns, just spray the area with sapidins, you know, but we'll kill all the coral and most of the fish when we do that at the same time. 
So there's lots of things you can do, but you're really limited when you start to consider those processes. Okay, this is a big one. Post rezoning of the Great Barrier Reef and the increase of impacts of climate change, COTS was the only threat to coral that was amenable to immediate and direct control. When we can do water quality, and we've done a lot of water quality over the last 50 years, we've spent a billion dollars in water quality management, handed it, a lot of it out, but we're still a long way of it to go to achieving our goals in terms of water quality. So when you think of what you can actually do right here and now to protect corals in the face of climate, COTS control is one of the only methods that you can actually do, or COTS management, I'll be accurate. Evolving the approach from terrestrial ecological approach to marine environment represented a big heap of challenges. There are a lot of researchers in the room today who have actually spent 20 odd years backwards and forwards looking at COTS. Um, but they, there was a lot of research that has come out, but not a lot was actually considering it within a pest management framework. They were looking at the ecology of COTS, they were looking at the biology, they were understanding life cycle, but not in a way of thinking how do we control this as a pest. So that was a fairly new concept. The existing management strategies were driven by the reef tourism industry, completely understandable. You know, the Marine Park Authority and, and the Queensland management were responding to the, marine, to the marine tourist industries at that time, and they wanted to protect their patch. And COTS was seen as one of the most devastating impacts on their patch at that point in time. And their monies were, they operated opportunistically, just where they thought they saw COTS, they moved in and stabbed them. And I was doing that when I was 16, going out, um, out to Beaver Cay and out to other areas on the reef out here, stabbing cots or collecting them, actually. We used to collect them and take them up and dig a big hole in the sand cay and bury them. All of us got stabbed half to death. How, how any of us survived it, I don't know, but anyway. And um, they operated local scale and, of course, had limited resources. Okay. Enter the National Environmental Science Program. And this was an opportunity to uh, pioneer a new structured approach. This meant bringing together a range of different research disciplines, existing COTS control operators who at the time were AMPTO and management agencies. Now, don't think at any time any of these people are going to agree with each other at any given point in time. Anyone who's been involved in the, um, in the marine management phase in the GBR knows that nobody agrees the vast majority of the time. So it's always an interesting process when you bring them, herd them all together in a room and lock the door so they can't get out. Um, and whilst then to add um, insult to injury for a lot of these players, to introduce a terrestrial, and I will say competent, there you go, Dave. I even wrote it down for he and his team, Cameron. Uh, a competent and experienced integrated pest terrestrial ecologist to actually lead the project. Now, I remember ringing Dave up and suggesting it to him, and he said, you're trying to ruin my life. And I said, yeah, yeah. And, um, but that was a new step to bring in a whole different discipline of science into the management of crown of thorns in a marine environment. Big step. Oops, I pressed the wrong button, sorry. Okay, and this is a comment from Dave and Cameron and others in his team. And struggling to adapt IPM from land based to marine was a big, big step. And for the research scientists involved, and I can see some of them around the room, and others, Morgan and others, this is a big step and difficult. But um, it does require some really considered strategies and approaches. Okay, there were two main issues. The primary method of COTS control was manual injection for starfish. Now, Morgan and his team took it from being just, uh, it was copper back in those days, and, and bringing it through to bile salts, which is really effective, and of course they use some vinegar now. Um, but bile salts and vinegar, but that means this approach you can do, you can clean out COTS out of a, reef, a single reef system, using this approach, but it's wildly expensive, right? And labour intensive, and that's not 300 reefs, it should be 3,000 plus reefs, sorry about that, it was a bad weekend. 
Okay, we needed a method to decide which reefs across the GBR should be targeted for control to achieve the greatest ecological and, don't get this, economic outcome. So yes, high value tourism reefs were part of that agenda, but also high value ecological components would need to be considered. Okay, the main aim, COTS populations to be reduced to densities with uh, which coral growth can outpace COTS damage. So you're not trying to rule the world here and eliminate COTS, you're just trying to get that balance, right? And the reason for this is the reef is facing so many threats from so many different directions that all you're trying to do is alleviate some of the pressure and give the reef a bit of a chance. And um, so no one's trying to take it all on, they're just trying to do that. Okay, how is this operationalised? Well, initially it was initially operationalised through the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority and thank you for that. Garumpa, so I'm giving them a nod. And then more recently, the Reef Trust Partnership and GBRF have taken over this monumental task. And I give a nod to Teresa over that process. There are currently five boats involved, Triple RC and Inlock, our partners, and you'll see them running around with little Inlock written on their shirts over there. And so a nod to them. And their partners are running three boats. And uh, and we're starting to change what this actually looks like. So there is a high level of Indigenous participation in these and it's going to be more and more and more. With a gradual hope that with capacity being built over the next five years to hand over the management of cots on sea country back to the traditional owners. But that takes time, it takes effort and it takes capacity building. And we're pretty committed to that. This is just a happy snap to show you people having. It's not all fun and games out there. It sounds great when you're first out and everyone signs up to the image of going out and controlling cots on the reef. Wait until the weather turns bad. Not so much fun. Okay, additionally, historically there's been, and this was run by AMPTO through the cots boats, which originally ran the boats, uh, was a major, um, uh, youth employment program and those sorts of processes continue on today but with a strong emphasis of building TO capacity in the region. Okay, I'll hurry up. Um, a review of the results under IPM today and this is going to be spoken a lot about but all I'm going to say is yes it works and you'll hear a lot of this today and you'll hear why and how it works and what we've measured as success and I know Mary and all those will talk at length about this, so I'll just jump over it right now. Okay, here's Dave and his team again, just saying they think they've done a pretty good job and they want to tell you about it, and they'll publish a lot of this, but they think they've filled in a whole lot of knowledge gaps, and I would agree with them, they definitely have, and have taken a concept and taken it through to operationalising a concept. Now, that's a big start. A whole lot of science never gets to do that. A whole lot of science never gets to take a concept right through to on-ground change. So it's a big step to see this happen. And it's thanks to all the people I keep mentioning around the, the ridges, it wouldn't happen without that support. Management agencies, funding agencies, government approvals, scientists, on-water operators, traditional owners, these things don't happen without that. Now, I get a chance to have a little bit of a kick and be my only chance for this conference, so I'm going to, um, doable future supplements to the IPM strategy. And this is the, just the current on water stuff. This is not some of the innovation that needs to come through and that's always needed in an integrated pest management program. Firstly is improved surveillance. At the moment our surveillance is, is pretty coarse and within that, I, these are my views, so I'm going to, uh, no one can stop me from having my views. Um, I'm very keen to see some fine scale surveillance come into that process and a combination of the two used much more successfully. And this may mean using the public as well, this may mean using a whole array of everything from citizen science to TO knowledge all the way through to improved surveillance te techniques including fine scale surveillance. Um, and that should give us improved reconnaissance for predictions. So we need intelligence gathering for predictions. 
and with that, we'll get more efficient logistics. So we'll know the timing. At the moment, everything is spatial, but we're not adding cot size, timing, and those components to this agenda. We need to do that to improve the efficiency. We need to know what time. We do this in agriculture. You look at the size of the instar of the, of the grub or you know the heliothus or whatever you're looking at, you know how long you have to go before you need to be back. At the moment we're doing rule of the thumb, we need more finessing to that process. We also want to improve workplace health and safety. Um, Mantito is can becoming increasingly dangerous in terms of workplace health and safety. You guys can stick your fingers in your ears for this bit. Um, with improved very large crocodiles up in the north in particular, we need to change some of this agenda. Luring someone behind a vessel slowly is not the smartest way to be looking at things. Um, we have underwater drones, image recognition, those things will come into full play. I'm more happy about divers going into the water as a team as opposed to just floating someone out the back. You know, I love fishing, so the concept doesn't go unheeded with me. Um, but I don't think anyone really wants to, uh, to actually say they want to be dragged behind as a lure. We also need to improve ecological conditions. When we were doing the rezoning of the marine park, we did it in terms of fisheries. We didn't do it in terms of items like crown of thorns management and others. It would be worth going back, and then Garumpa can stick their fingers in their ears for this bit. It'd be worth going back and looking at the zoning and seeing what we can amend over the period of time to improve some of that use that um, the zoning in terms of adding to capacity for um, uh, COTS control. And of course, there's water quality improvement. And that stands as a big and challenging process that we will be going through for a long time. So thank you very much for everyone. Sorry to bore you to death with the story of integrated pest management, but it's worth setting the scene for what we have to come. And also it gave me a chance to have a bit of a kick about what I think we need into the future for the program. Thank you. Thank you.